Hi. Over the past uh, few years, I've been doing a series of five books on countries that have been doing very well in terms of growing rapidly over the past decade. Ethiopia, Ghana, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zambia. And in all these cases, the growth has been broadly based across several sectors of the economy. So it's broadly based and looks stable, and if these growth rates could be sustained for another decade, these countries would become middle-income countries. So the stakes are very high. Now, the question I'm asking today is, can these growth rates be maintained? And one of the things that would certainly be required, if you look at what's been happening in these countries, is that this will require a qualitative move forward in the breadth and depth of the industrial sector of these countries. And it's this particular aspect of prospects for growth that I want to focus on today. The things that I want to talk about are based on this series of books, the Enterprise Map series, which looks at the industries one by one, the main firms in those industries, and where their capabilities came from, and what they're currently doing. And what's interesting is that a very clear and consistent picture emerges when we look across these five economies. The picture that emerges when you look across these economies is that there are certain industries that you see almost everywhere. Food and drink, a wide range, ranging from sugar industry across to the beer industry, in metals, you get basic engineering services up to drawn wire, galvanized sheet, that kind of thing. In plastics, uh, molded products up to heavy pipes for the construction industry. Building materials, cement, bricks, tiles. And within that range of industries, there are some really excellent companies. If you look at Bacressa flour mills in Tanzania, it's a world-class operation. If you look at Lafarge cement in Zambia, it's a world-class operation. So the highlights across that particular range of industries are quite impressive. So what do these industries have in common? Well, there's no international supply chain with other firms whose quality standard you must meet. And they have a fairly safe domestic market that's big enough to support them. Their supply chain can largely be internalized within the country or involve some straightforward commodity imports. Once we move beyond this range of manufacturing industry into middle manufacturing, which will be the challenge for these five countries over the next decade, then we need a qualitatively different kind of environment. An environment in which firms become part of international supply chains. They are sourcing intermediate goods. They are transforming them. They are exporting either intermediate or final goods back through multinational run supply chains. And here, the quality standards are hugely high. And moving to this kind of mid-range industrial activity is the challenge that I want to talk about today. In a background project associated with the Enterprise Map series, I've looked in detail at all those countries whose industrial sectors grew from being very small to being very large over the past 50 years. And a striking fact emerges. It is that none of the countries involved moved forward by expanding their existing narrow industrial base. In all cases, they began from a broadening of the industrial base into middle manufacturing with its large export opportunities. And after that broadening was accomplished, they then moved forward to hugely increase their level of industrial output. In other words, with that narrow industrial base, you don't have the scope for the kind of industrial growth that these countries are aiming at. And the first thing they will need to do is to broaden the industrial base. And the royal road towards doing that, broadening of the industrial base, is the introduction of a large increase in foreign direct investment in the manufacturing area. Now we're uh, touching on a big subject here, which is um, how you industrialize. And today, for the sake of uh, focusing on the essentials, 
I want to point out the one thing that occurs predominantly in almost all cases is that this transition to a broader industrial base is mediated by an inflow of manufacturing FDI. You can't reinvent the wheel all the time. There are occasional examples like Bharat Forge in India of domestic companies that simply move under their own steam to and beyond the international frontier in their particular sub-market. But that's rare, and you certainly can't count on that as something that will lift a whole country forward. It's the huge inflows of FDI that bring with them the integration of the country into the international economy that mediates that broadening of the industrial base in almost every case. So what do multinationals bring to a country? Essentially, they catalyze change right along the supply chain of the local industry as they shift to local sourcing over time and thereby bring up the capabilities of local mid-sized companies that get drawn into international supply chains in that way. And that's their biggest single contribution. They catalyze industrial development and the broadening of industrial activity. So the question I want to ask is, what are the challenges? What's new? What's going to happen in these countries if this transition to a more broad industrial base occurs over the next decade? And there are a few basic economic lessons that really carry very strong implications for policy for these five countries right now. A good place to start on the policy discussion is by asking, what is the most striking thing that happens in the economy where this transition takes place? And the answer is there's a huge surge in imports of intermediate products. Because you're no longer producing on the basis of locally produced inputs. You're producing things that rely essentially on the import of components, sub-assemblies, things that are coming in through the multinational supply chains. So one thing that you really have to anticipate if you think the country is going to industrialize is you've got to expect that the channels for importing intermediate goods are well functioning. In many cases, these systems are at their limits and firms are finding it very difficult to very slow, very cumbersome to import inputs. And this is the kind of thing that is going to escalate in importance over the next 10 years. So one of the priorities for countries should be asking, how can we fast track intermediate inputs through the customs and revenue channels? Um, how can we make it easier in terms of paperwork? How can we make it quicker in terms of time? How can we make it more routine? And how can we prioritize those companies that are importing intermediate goods who are going to be our main exporters? So that's one of the types of challenge that these countries are going to face. And there are many others. I'm just going to focus on two, however, because these two come up all the time. And they're absolutely central in the case of these five countries. The first of them is attracting FDI. Attracting FDI is the job of the local investment agency. Um, I've been involved over the past couple of years in reforming the functioning of the Ethiopian investment agency in collaboration with the director general, Mr. Fitz and Morega. And uh, we've learned a lot about the transition that's needed in that particular instance, and I think it's probably needed in many other countries in the region as well, which is a shift away from the traditional process of saying, we're giving you permits to operate in this country. That is an oversight approach as against a relationship building approach. A great deal is talked about the importance of having one-stop shop and so on. But that's really just a preliminary. The real challenge that was met so successfully by those countries that pioneered investment agencies, um, Singapore, Finland, and Ireland, and whose practice has been carried across the world, is that at the heart of the agency's business is the task of relationship building. That is, making sure that instead of putting out fires all the time, you are anticipating difficulties. You are meeting with companies as they begin following the acquisition of a permit to start operations. 
you're anticipating difficulties that the government or the agency should be able to help with, and you're maintaining contact with them after they become operational. Half the battle is that so few of these companies ever even advance to becoming operational employing anybody. In the case of Ethiopia, it was about one-fifth of the companies. That figure can easily be turned into one-half by having proper relationship building with the companies and anticipating difficulties that are unnecessary and fixable. A second doubling of the number of successful employment creators comes from dealing with companies after they become operational. Simply looking at the figures here is staggering. Half of all the jobs created by foreign companies in Ireland have been created by multinationals that were already operating in the country. Because they have good experience, with the help of the agency, in operating smoothly and effectively in the country, they will choose that country as their next base of operation when they expand their business or they open up a new business. And this is another opportunity to double the number of jobs created by foreign companies. So that's the kind of prioritizing that's needed at the level of investment agencies. Now let me turn to another topic which comes up all the time and which is particularly prominent at the moment in Tanzania and Mozambique, which is that they are about to develop offshore gas and that's going to bring in multinationals. There's a dramatic change in bargaining power here. Instead of asking multinationals to come through your investment agency, they're coming automatically because that's where the gas is, or in Ghana's case, where the oil is. And so what's happening is that these multinationals are coming, and unless you really think about it very carefully and plan it in advance, there is a great danger that a familiar pattern will develop, which is that they become segmented away from the local economy and don't integrate with it. The outcome you want is the opposite of that. It's one in which domestic firms are drawn into participation in the supply chain of the multinational companies, which not only builds the capabilities of the local companies across a whole range of activities, but which also gives you the opportunity to build up capabilities that can be spun off into new activities by domestic companies in the medium term. The surprising massive success story in this area is Colombia, which managed this process so well that they generated successful mid-sized domestic companies that are now doing major international business and specialized services in the oil and gas industry. So trying to get maximum involvement of local companies is the job of a local content unit. And it's crucial that a local content unit be set up, which is really highly professional, with people that know how to discuss sensibly with oil and gas multinationals the pros and cons of different ways forward. This is a very tricky area, and it's full of misconceptions. The first misconception is that all the jobs involve engineering and what we would like is local companies that are involved in building rigs and facilities. That is part of the story and it's an important part of the story. But if that's the story you're telling, you're going to miss two-thirds of the opportunities. What is most remarkable is the range of activities involved. The first area that's really hit is construction. That's where the huge initial impact comes. And if local construction companies are not up to speed in being able to subcontract to major construction companies, then huge opportunities are lost because mid-sized subcontractors will be brought in from abroad. In services, people tend to systematically underestimate the range of opportunities that exist for local mid-sized companies. If I wanted to get rich, I'd... Uh, I'd go to one of these countries and go into helicopter leasing. The retail sector is hugely affected. In the whole area of port development, the way in which Takaradi Port in Ghana was transformed from having very little economic activity around it to being an absolute hive of economic activity is quite staggering. An often overlooked area is food services, catering, and the huge jumping capabilities that can come 
from local mid-sized companies in that sector who get involved in international supply chains. One of the saddest things that you see in this industry in Africa is plain loads of food and drink being shipped in for consumption by workers in multinational companies when with proper integration of local food and drink firms into the supply chain, as has happened in countries elsewhere in the world, you get a huge boost to local economic activity, a huge jump in capability for local firms in that segment, and a saving on inputs. General manufacturing is boosted all the way down to things like furniture. Engineering is, of course, central. There are all kinds of lessons to be learned by looking at Ghanaian experience, for example. Local companies need to have a rise in capabilities to bring them into the window of capabilities where they can interact successfully in supply chains. This often involves finding a foreign partner. And if you find the right foreign partner, then that's enormously helpful. But finding a foreign partner that isn't going to be well regarded by the multinational that you're hoping to do business with is not so helpful. So a local content unit needs to take the lead in coordinating the discussions and interactions between local engineering companies and the multinational oil and gas companies. And this kind of mediation requires a very high level of professionalism in terms of the local content unit. The whole point is to get away from these unhelpful quantitative restrictions, like we want 70% local content, which are so easily bypassed, into an active discussion that begins from a proper understanding of the capabilities of domestic companies and a realistic appraisal of which ones can be brought up to speed. Usually, you need to set up a training center with two halves, a business half and a technical half where firms can come and get training in-house a couple of days a week, or experts can be sent out to go to companies for a period of months, hand-holding and bringing them up to international standards in various business and technical areas. This kind of thing takes a couple of years to put in place and run successfully, and so early action is essential. That's why, for Tanzania and Mozambique, this is a question of great urgency. I've had to be very brief today. Um, these are just a few of the themes that emerge from looking at the Enterprise Map series. It's been fun doing the series, and uh, I'm glad I've got to the uh, fifth and last volume of the series with Mozambique now appearing. And uh, these are some of the things that I've found interesting in the projects that have built up around it.